My name is Noah Becker. I'm an art magazine publisher. I'm an artist. I wanted to make a film about contemporary art in New York and the artists that live and work there. New York has a long history of incredible things happening there in contemporary art. The world is decentralized now. Artists can be seen on the internet in a way that they couldn't be seen before. The scene has changed and the downtown scene is different than it was in the 1980s. Some of the people that we're going to talk to are personal friends with figures in the New York art world like Jean-Michel Basquiat or Andy Warhol. And in a way that gives context to the scene where it's been and where it is now. see um, these kinds of things like like social media and global the globalizing of the art world in a more acute way than than maybe uh, it was our well, to it's, make. A big, it's really a big difference um, when when well, let's say when I came you know having gone to college in Ohio no idea of an art world knew of a historical art world because of a father involved in art history and you know, the history of art, but nothing to do with contemporary art. Coming to New York, um, meeting kind of by chance a group of people who became this small, really small um, focal point of kind of like-minded people who all came from Louisiana, wherever they came, came to New York um, and were doing what they you know, were beginning to do what they were going to do. And we're looking at everything. And what is that they're looking at? They know, they know expressionism, they know uh, pop art, they know minimal, which is in full blossom. Uh, and they're trying to, now what do we do, you know, that's different? What can, what can we do? And, and do we go extreme or do we move slowly away from those things? There was no communication. There's no cell phone. We live in uh, shells of buildings where you put in a bathroom and you put in a hot plate and a refrigerator. Um, you meet at only at places, at a bar, and at a restaurant that Gordon Mata started. Um, and you just m make art wherever you can. Uh, Almost, you know, maybe there, when I got to New York, there were three or three art, three galleries, maybe four at the most, that were just beginning in Soho. When a lot of them came, those weren't even there. Um, so it's just word of mouth 
and by chance meeting someone who says this. Um, today, with the internet, you see what's happening all over the world. Uh, you see, with the magazines, you know, at that point there was Art News, I think. Uh, Avalanche Magazine was a really small, small intellectual kind of publication just for a very small group of people, mostly who were in New York. Things about art in New York are generally portrayed in kind of a stereotypical way. If you're not in New York, yes, I agree. Yeah, it's people. all kind of flash without substance and, and it's always like pictures of all the famous artists of the past or mm -hmm. maybe something, you know, like my perception of New York and my experience in New York is a lot different. But and you I, lived here. Every 15 minutes someone will be famous. Every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes someone will be famous. Every 15 minutes someone will be famous. Every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes someone will be famous. And someone will be famous. And someone will be famous. Or ever. I want to make what Hollywood did for America in the 20th century. I want art to do for America in the 21st century. That I want to indoctrinate the world with our ideas and perspective through art. The city has a tendency to swallow people, you know, and if you're from another part of the country, you know, and you come here, your tendency is to become a part of something. I think what's happened now is that it's kind of more international or people move around a lot more because of the internet so you can find out about someone doing something in another country, another world, much more quickly without being there. It's like you can do a studio visit with almost anybody. You can do a studio visit with somebody in China by looking at the pictures that they have on their social media site. You know what I mean? You right. can instantaneously say something to them to go like, oh, that part was interesting or something. You get in a conversation with several different people about it if, if you find it interesting. So, I mean, obviously pictures aren't uh, nearly as good as the real experience, but. Right. Well, it's made it kind of more open and democratic. And if you're doing something interesting, you can connect with someone in China who might be doing something interesting that's similar to yours, whereas, you know, when I was coming, I mean, you, it's pretty much the telephone. You woke up one day in LA and you decided, I want to go to New York. Yeah, well, you know, I was an art history student in LA and I was interning at the galleries out there and there was kind of a lack of momentum for me in the Culver City scene. It's changed a lot since then. It's grown a lot and expanded tremendously. But when I was out there, I felt like not a lot of work was really getting done on the business end. Like a lot of creativity was taking place and there's a lot of beautiful inspiration to draw from Los Angeles as a city. But I just didn't feel the pace that I wanted. And then I started visiting New York and visiting galleries in New York and I realized that this was where I needed to be to do what I wanted to do, <laughs> which is sell it. The city has been broken into twice here since I've occupied it. You know, I don't think one can say New York is the center of the art world. That there is no center, really. The downtown scene, right? Like, New York is, has become a more of a global place anyway. Even, it's always been a global place, but it's become even more so now. Like, there's so many people from all, so many countries all the time that you're always dealing with here. Up, and I think the best people that are the best at whatever they do even come here. Now the social networking thing is good too. You end up meeting a lot of people from all over the world, but if they're not here, they can't, you have to be on the scene in order to be able to really make something happen for yourself, I think. You know, it's one thing to be able to, you know, meet people and things, but I think there's a big difference between what's on the computer as to what's reality is, and like, I think there's still a bit of respect, I think, for being able to do it in New York. You know, there is that old song, you know, if I can make it here, I'll make it anywhere. Yeah, it's totally true, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's essential to be in New York. I mean, if you get disconnected from New York, you get disconnected from a lot of the creativity which goes on. And, uh, you know, the market is definitely uh, essentially here still. But you can't, you know, saying that New York is the center of the art world would be abusive. Do you feel like New York has a pulse and there's like something happening with kind of like the downtown scene now? 
Well, I mean, I think New York always has a pulse to it. I mean, it's New York. There's the potential that I might teach it on fucking high school, yeah. <laughs> which is insane. The yeah, chair yeah. of the department loves me. I mean, I think she loves me, loves me, but uh, she also loves my art. And, and I, I've substituted taught at that school, and my yeah, yeah. students they love me. They were like, yeah, we learned more today but, than we have in the last but, year. But, 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 so, 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 so. All the art galleries that I've shown and have been through my either my Flickr or Facebook. Right. But it's just that I have 5,000 friends now and, you know, I also, I think also my writing, you know, having a column does kind of get me out and about. But, um, so it was kind of, yeah, like this guy Robert Greco, he has a, art galleries in New Jersey, so I've, I've shown maybe like 12 times at different ones and they flew me out to Detroit for the other show that they had. And he just met me just purely from my Flickr, started writing to me. To be fair, on the, on the Bravo <laughs> show, it was mostly you riding around in a... In an, yeah, Audi, in an Audi, yeah. Audi, which I felt Getting like, inspired, yeah. Well, I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying that's that's what we saw. Yeah. So. I get inspired by, yeah, images but, I but saw other, in my childhood. The other interesting story is yeah. that I, probably the thing that most people know your work from is from being on a TV show, but you do not own a TV and probably hadn't watched TV in 10 years. I don't, yeah, I don't watch TV Which I think is kind of like an interesting, we were, we were talking about, like, you know where a scene exists, you know, right. like, and how it kind of comes together. Right. And, um, it's like that that didn't really exist. Like you didn't watch anything that told you about that, that existed somewhere separate. It was something independent. It took me forever to figure out what the art world was. You know, I didn't oh, really, know, I didn't know, really know until no, grad school, and I still don't know. Convinced him to show here by punching him in the face repeatedly. Exactly. Is that what we're yeah. Someone was yeah. someone was actually talking bad about Marlboro. Is how it all started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I did what I had to do. Tell me a little bit about what's kind of being put together here. Uh, so essentially, it's going to be uh, three high and. Well, I should step back and say the original the original piece was a sort of three by four unit um, that went through the range of colors that were available in, in the Plasticine brand that I was using. Mm -hmm. So it sort of was like a color catalog of, of those of those options. And then the idea is to sort of just tile that progressively out to fit whatever space is needed. So it's sort of a, that's sort of what I mean by being site sensitive. You know, kind of expand or contract uh, as necessary. <laughs> culture workers, people who run coffee, people who work at the front desk of galleries, and maybe don't represent the most exciting, most glamorous people in the art world. But they may be very sophisticated in their thoughts, and they may have a vast background in contemporary art.
So then you were working at Marlboro when you got to New York? No, I worked at Bjorn Mesla first, which was amazing. It's on the Upper East Side, and the Upper East Side galleries, I just love them so much. Well, Joe and I went through the armory together, right? That was fun. The armory is always fun. It's, it's a little bit like going to the mall. And I had to call Maya Picasso and um, speak to her in French because Bjorn was Swedish, so he didn't speak French, and ask if one of these drawings was actually authentic. A lot of people are not, they're slightly disturbed by, you know, the act and the sort of, you know, the horse and its erection, which is very graphic, you know, very sort of in your face. But as you look through it as a series, it's actually very beautiful. It's all black and white, um, and you look through it and it, you sort of, look through it more in sense of movement. Mm. So, yeah, so. so that's one of the last things we did. And I quite like that book actually. Not, I don't know what people thought of it, but... <laughs> but it you were doing the Herman Nietzsche yeah, show. Yeah, her too. And yeah, you I was, was doing oh, that and you too. As well. oh, and we you were the participants. Oh, oh you okay. were the participants. Yeah. Wait, I think I remember you. Yeah, yeah I I, I thought maybe you had one of those New York stories of coming here and climbing the ladder and finally finding a job or something like that. Oh God, well, when I got here I was a gallery assistant part-time at the gallery, straight out of college. Oh, I, I worked at Magnolia Icing Cupcakes. Was that before? Uh, it was simultaneous so I could pay my rent. Was that before it became <laughs> world famous for its Sex in the City episode? Uh, I, no, I think it was already world famous so that kind of made it even more horrific to ice cupcakes at Magnolia. Right. Um, but since I was artsy, they thought I'd be good at decorating cupcakes, which I really wasn't good at. I think they just didn't fire me because they right. felt bad. Did you guys have fun doing it? Yeah, it, it, took, it was like a lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah, you feel like so, you guys must have been exhausted. We, we took a week off after that. <laughs> we pretty much <laughs> sat on a bench. <laughs> Afterwards, we were just like covered in paint, and it would like take hours to scrape off. You were building the armory. You were actually working on building the space. Yeah, I helped install a booth. Um, and you did Art Basel. You worked as building Art Basel as well in Miami. Several times. Mm -hmm. You know, I do that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you built Spencer's house, right? I did. I built Spencer's house out of cereal boxes that. Uh, I saved them up. Yeah. General Mills donated uh, around 40,000 cereal boxes. He coated the uh, front facade of the house with uh, Captain Crunch. Thank right. you, Joe. We had to do like a lot of art handling the next couple of days. Yeah. They only have one art handler there. So it was like up to us to like pretty much get everything together. We had to like hang these massive paintings. But it was fun. And that's how I was introduced to the art world in New York City on my first day. And ever since then, it's been the same thing every day without Picasso's relatives all the time. Mm -hmm. Been working on um, been working a lot on a collaboration recently with uh, Raymond Pettibone. Right. Um, so some of these things that you see on this wall are, are Raymond's, and you know we we've traded a bunch of drawings, like half finished drawings, and mm -hmm. and trying to figure out. Um, I've been trying to figure out a way to maybe do something where it's a real collaboration, where I'm combining his drawings and my drawings, and then overlaying text on top, which we haven't gotten to yet. I'm so used to working in a collaborative sense musically, and when uh, the idea first came up between Raymond and I, it was, it was, I mean, even though so far we haven't done it in the same room at the same time, you know, uh, pencil in one hand, glass of wine in the other hand, or whatever, we asked him to do a record cover for us, which was Goo, which was our first major label record, and in a way that seemed like a good time to ask him, I mean, on one hand, his his artwork at that point was mostly associated with records by Black Flag and and the Minutemen, and so on the one hand, it seemed a little um, little strange to us to be asking him to do one of our record covers. You know, this New York band, not really a California band at all, but um, it was our first re record for a major label, and um, you know, we wanted to 
show right away when you looked at the record cover sort of where we were coming from and we thought that Raymond's work was a really good indicator for that so um, you know we chose to do that he was really cool about it we have subsequently used a few of us, his images on other projects and uh, you know like I said we've been uh, just recently talking about you know doing some drawing collaborations mm -hmm. Art fairs. If you've never been to one, they're extremely exciting. Walking into an art fair is a huge rush. You might see some celebrities and some art stars. If you've never been to an art fair, I would highly recommend it. is about the you know the social aspect of it indeed that uh, and the experience of you know, you know emotionally feeling the you know the rush of running into an art fair it, it, such a thing is really difficult to create online I think that it, the social aspect is, is incredibly important like say what you want about our various tastes art is is necessarily subjective right and so if it is subjective then there has to be something else that, that determines this like ranking and so um, your 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 social milieu is is just so important and it's, it's it's a shame and it seems like it's not a meritocracy but it is it's not a secret that um, you know you you need to know the people who are going to show your art and you need to know the people who are potentially going to buy your art it, it just m it makes it much more difficult if if you don't and if you and when kids move to New York to go to grad school or whatever the case may be they um, you know they party down like you said and you know maybe you end up you know doing lines with some you know big time art dealer um, at four in the morning and then that comes back to help you out down the road I don't know <laughs> but um, I, you know, there's I, no you I have friends who network on Facebook and send things that they like paintings they like to their, their other friends, but they're about an inch by an inch. And I ask my friends, how can you recommend this? I, I mean, I can't see it. I don't know what it is, I can't, because I need to see the material. So there's something odd there about you know so-called traditional vi um, visual art working electronically. The art world is less centralized than it once was, but I think it kind of will continue to be sort of centralized because, you know, art is, it's not a true commodity and that the, the most pieces of art are unique and you have to see them in person, right? And so it, it's advantageous for art to kind of group together so people can come and see it here. I think.
the social networking thing, it helps, but I mean, who's going to believe anything that they see on the internet, really, unless it's more solid right. than that? Well, we know? were t we were just talking with uh, another artist earlier. Also, I think you have to have your own website, too. I think your own website is more important than, uh, say, the social media. Huh. But I think that also social media then connects you in different ways. And it also, I think it probably increases, I'm sure I have more hits on my website because of the social media. My dad is like, he didn't even graduate high school, you know. He just is getting up on how to use computers. He had never been to my website. And he uh, he does a lot of he does construction, so he does like uh, custom kitchens and stuff like that. He was doing work for this lady who's a Mormon, and uh, she was like, "Oh, we want to see Ryan's website." So like, he's like, "Oh yeah, it's RyanSchultz.com." So like, her son pulls it up, and they're like crowded around the computer, and like. Like, the first image they see is a guy wearing a necktie, tying it around his arm with a syringe in his mouth. And they were just like, <laughs> uh, next. And then it's like somebody doing coke, and then it's like, next. And it's like somebody smoking crack, and like, my dad hadn't seen these paintings. He's seen the paintings I did like in high school, you know? I was looking at some of your work online, um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting stuff. I'd like to see more of it in, in the flesh. I'm gonna have to go by freight and volume. <laughs> a... Yeah, you, you can you can get an idea, I suppose, from, from online, but some of them, you don't get an idea of scale, uh, and you don't get an idea of texture, and, and, you know, and, and actually making marks is something that you really miss when you look at work online. You know, you, you miss the quality of the brush marks, and, you know, even the color to a degree. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you get a rough idea. The physicality of an art, of a sculpture is something that they were talking about earlier as being something that gets yeah, lost. That's totally true. That's totally true. And Even paintings and stuff too. You can't, there's no way to take a picture of, of artwork really and get the feeling of it completely. Any of the galleries that I, that I work with on a semi-regular, regular basis, I am aware of the works that they are bringing. I have seen pictures or packing lists. I've seen the price lists. Although I won't buy anything without physically laying eyes on it, things are certainly, you know, on reserve for me for that first day that need to be on reserve. So uh, that access uh, takes a, a certain edge off of the uh, proceedings that, you know, when you get right to the opening, you know, the fair, like the armory at noon, um, or 11.30 actually is when the opening is, and uh, you know, you see people pressed up against the glass, you know, you know, like this. Um, it, there's no need to feel you need to be first one in rushing down the aisle like a wildebeest. Uh, I can wander in an hour later after that initial crush and, and, and do what I need to do. So, in terms of New York as an art scene, it kind of represents the world still from what we're hearing from people like Michael Anderson and other people. Like, I was uh, delving into the concept of it being kind of fragmented and, and decentralized by, by social media and the internet. And oh no, I think that's exactly the opposite. Because, as a matter of fact, just before you came in, I was talking to a man in Southern California who had gone on the internet because he saw Judith Schechter's work at the LA County Museum and found us on the internet because we, re we represent her exclusively, called us up, said, oh, I just saw your artist. And so, I mean, that sort of a connection probably couldn't have been made otherwise. And also, you look at Picasso's women, a woman standing in front of the mirror, if you see it on the, on the fucking MoMA website or something, it's not nearly as cool as if you're standing in front of it. You know, when you're standing in front of that painting, it's really devastating, you know? I think um, collectors have been, you know, going to gallery sites and looking at artists' work on the internet for a long time, and and uh, so there again, the methodology for that already exists. So, and certainly going to artists' sites and artist blogs discreetly to to, to to look at work. So I don't know again exactly how much social networking aids that process, uh, except to add another venue where artists can, you know, sort of talk or show an already existent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this remains to be seen and I'll be really curious and excited to see honestly how it plays out over time. If it's a if it's a help, if it's a hindrance, if if artists indeed do or can band together into something meaningful, not just for the sake of doing it because of frustration with the gallery system or an inability to um, uh, able with an, an inability to actually um, 
you know, migrate or move into the gallery system for whatever reason that has to do with their work and or the gallery system. Um, but I'll be, I I'm, I'm really want to know how this is all going to play out and I really watch it with a, with a great deal of interest. create these virtual galleries and then, you know, like kind of really remedial type of sketch up programs and then mm -hmm. people would hang stuff in them and yes. you could like zoom in on them or whatever. And whether the or not... The best ones had like bright flash, like going yeah. from red to white behind the paintings. Yeah, exactly. This one is really significant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, in, in speaking about all that, I mean, I, I, I sort of, you know, one of the things that I brought up is that for as much as people like to talk about you know, decentralization or disembodiment. It actually, what I, I what I found is that it it, it brings in to play more about being actually there, like actually showing up and being physically present in, in spaces and and being in front of works like that to have that kind of direct relationship. And we have all of our our devices and. Um, and our methods of seeing things now, but it's, um, you know, they're inherently, and we're in this kind of transitional period, like tablets and things like that, I mean, they're fairly uncool to handle. I mean, the, the way you look into them is always interesting, the content, and it can be quite exciting. But as, a, as an experience, you know, it's not that, it's not, it's not, that exciting. not that exciting. I was in Toronto recently, I had an exhibition there at a gallery. Very few people internationally have access to any of these shows, it's such a limited amount of people that can actually physically be there. Once you have something in print or on the internet, it gives it a longevity that there's just no way it would be possible otherwise. I think the thing that's great about New York is that it's constantly in flux and it's reinventing itself. So even if one scene sort of fades away, like Soho and then Williamsburg and now the Lower East Side, there's there's always something going on that draws people that they can create their own sort of magic because although you can say that there was, um, you know, I don't think New York rests on its laurels. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's... Yeah, you know, I, mean, I don't want to get the impression that I don't think you can be an artist in a different place but I think it's, it's, you have to do a lot more work there. You know, the, if you are an artist in a, in a small town not near New York, you're kind of making your own art position there. Here, this city can support 500 artists. You know what I mean? Like the, the infrastructure is there, or more than that. You know, there's, there's it's just, it, the, the big pile of money is here. There's the people who want to support it. There's, there's a large community that's really um, interested in, in supporting young art here. York, it's infiltrated from all sides, um, like pop culture has become art, art's become popular culture, and so it's more accessible to the general public. Um, like for example, even the, you know, the Tim Burton show at MoMA, everyone knows who Tim Burton is, he's an illustrator, um, but at the same time it was at MoMA, so it's kind of elevated to this level of, of high art. Um, but then, pop then art is also being brought into pop culture, like in the in the Bravo show, work of art. You know, people who watch Bravo who wouldn't necessarily know as much about the art world are, you know, finding out um, more about that. So I think it's kind of an interesting mix, and it's it's kind of becoming infiltrated from all sides. Uh, My goal, whatever I do, whether it's with the gallery or the TV show. Or doing stuff for you know magazines and newspapers is I want everyone in the United States to have a working knowledge of contemporary art in this country the way they do Hollywood or music I feel like art is painfully underrepresented and I can't really figure out why so it's my goal in my lifetime to change that Bill Powers was talking about uh, about Andy Warhol in relation to like artists mm -hmm. using 
music, movies, television, and media mm -hmm. to like promote art. Mm -hmm. And I, I asked him about reality TV and, and we discussed that. What do you think about the concept of art being disseminated and presented through the like a reality TV sort of thing? Love it. Next okay. question. In James Franco's case, I think he's mm -hmm. used it to sort of I don't know, displace, he, he brings Caleb Lindsay, a performance artist who does, you know, incredibly esoteric work about male sexuality and, and transgendered and um, uh, minority sexuality in a way that that guy getting mainstream attention is an amazing moment to me. I think that's great, right? And that it came filtered through James Franco, great, actually, like that, that he would enable that. So there, there's a certain amount of admiration that I have for that. I think if Warhol were alive today, he would be totally into reality TV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did some TV shows. Yeah. What about the internet? 15 minutes. Right. Andy Warhol's yeah. 15 right. minutes, yeah. Right. Um, and in some ways, that was some fledgling reality TV he had there, where there's early clips with, you know, Marc Jacobs doing his first, you know, fashion show, and, you know, Debbie Harry, and all these people, that I think it really seemed like he would have followed that path to me. Reality TV in relation to Andy Warhol um, and the art world being uh, turned into a reality TV show. What do you think his perception of it? I would have absolutely adored it. I mean, he invented reality TV. It was interesting the response I got from friends and from people within the art world, like saying, yeah, that's crazy, and I'm, you know, wrecking mm -hmm. reputation or whatever. And, I, and I, my feeling was like, how, you know, the only way I would do that is if I, uh, you know, like said, like, if I wasn't confident by what I, I thought about art. And I, I feel like I'm, you know, why not raise the level of discussion? Why not go there and um, be able to talk about uh, the work in a way that, you know, uh, respects what people are trying to do and try to get something going further? It's, you know, and reach many more people than the art world would normally reach on any. Yeah, you know, something like two million viewers. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. You never want to present art to people just, hey, come to this gallery or museum. I think, right. you know, when Kanye West has George Kondo doing his album covers, or Lady Gaga's collaborating with Terrence Coe, or Ryan McGinley shooting a Levi's campaign, and people are exposed to art and don't recognize it as such, that's a way to get a foot in the door. It was the Rolling Stones' choice to hire me to, to make this picture for Rolling Stone magazine. So I wasn't hired by Rolling Stone magazine, I was hired by the Rolling Stones. Or, you know, the Shepard Ferry, um, you know, Obama campaign, or exit through the gift shop. Those are all great ways for people to be exposed to art without the traditional path people take to get there. Again, over Charlie Watts' shoulder, Keith. Uh, yeah. Well, wow, that's a cool book. Yeah, it's fun. It's like a little uh, kind of sketchbook of what what I did. Mm -hmm. My favorite images and um, and just uh, something. If this is actually the miniatures of a show I did in, in 1984. Art used to be like an event within the city, mm -hmm. you know, with like the Roman frescoes and it was something that people went out and saw. It was, it was a part of your day and I think, you know, with, with this media heavy culture that we live in, what, what has happened to to art is that it's gotten kind of over, overtaken by all this other imagery and so it wasn't so much about the thought that went into the image anymore it was about all these crazy like exchanges you know like this movie is this and then this does that and boom 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 and like really fast um, and I think the internet in a way it can be a tool that we can sneak into and it's like, oh wait, no, there's, there's still art there. I watch two television. Uh, 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 friends from Kia makes a left hand, a right one person show. Some friends from high school and... 
I used to have, that was with them. People have called your films boring and, and lifeless and tedious and horrible. And how do you respond, Andy, to people that, that say that about your films? And you just, you know, you had sunglasses and you just kind of sat there and went, oh. That, that's what we think. Well, that piece is about fame. You're gonna kind of like it because it's a little bit about star fucking. <laughs> I can't. I, I think it's called. I think it's called Mexican Graffiti slash Studio Fifty Four. And uh, you see, it has like Michael Jackson and Madonna there, like kind of the main figures there. And neither one, they're both together, but neither one of them is looking at either each other or at the camera, in either camera. They're looking, they're both working completely on being famous there. You know, I made that one piece called Black Music versus Helvetica, which I'm going to show at the Ringling Museum uh, during the show Beyond Bling. I'm in a show with Kehinda Wiley and Michelaine Thomas and all these other black artists. I'm so happy. I can't believe it, you know? Have you, what if you did like a portrait series where you just have heads yeah. and posters? Yeah. I could do that repeat, too. You know when you I get could like also, a poster? Oh, you want me to do like Warhol? I see no, like no, things no. like, I hardly ever make the same thing twice. Like look how strange and different each piece I make is. They're, they're somewhat similar, but they have, they're radically different. See with this, even in that, like that, that's enough. Like yeah. if that was just glued down. It's gonna and, look cool, and right? in a, a frame, frame like oh, that. Oh, just in a frame. Just yeah. a little, like, yeah. sort of. It's not like, complicated enough. I like to have. Like, write stuff on well, the all the time. Just on all the time. Two televisions. Just write. I watch two televisions. I watch two televisions. I watch two. I watch two televisions. That was on all the time. Drink. Uh. Uh. I was here, and you were working on the series that you have on show at White Cube mm -hmm. in London. Yes. And that's uh, it's subject to most really wanted. About, yes. Is it most wanted? Mm -hmm. And it was DiCaprio, this is like naming the members of Wu Tang. Like I was I'm trying to think Wu uh, um, uh, DiCaprio, um, Taylor Momsen, mm -hmm. Dakota Fanning, who mm -hmm. else did we have? Well, I mean, I can name them all. Oh, I'm sure you can. <laughs> you know, for, the, for the men, yeah, that's uh, DiCaprio, Timberlake, right. Right. Uh, Chase Crawford, mm -hmm. uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. You've balanced out your females with some man candy in the female. Exactly. Yeah, and, then, and they come from television, uh, music, and, and cinema. Um, and they all have a, a certain command of, um, you know, a global uh, right. focus on uh, entertainment. Did, and then, did they stop by? Did any of them stop by? No, I mean, the show wasn't about, I mean, I never contacted their publicists or, or did anything, because the show really wasn't about that type of, uh, um, you know, which is more of a kind of Warholian thing of like, of trying to raise the, 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 the status of the artist into a celebrity. It really was more about the people who are going to look at the show and the condition that we're in, uh, being immersed in this type of, um, you know, uh, endorsement and, um, you know, celebrity uh, culture. Well, I watch two televisions at one time, so... Uh, 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 uh.
Renaudi Chimaizel Gallery. Where's that? It's on 57th and 6th Avenue. So yeah, I'm excited about that. It's my first real show since college. Where'd you go? Parsons. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Parsons. How did you like that? Wall Street Journal. Oh, that's my email address. Wow, cool, right? Wow. Yeah, nice. They have the pictures. It was in color, and um, it was. Uh, it talks about how, like, I shot this video. Um, I made one of the first rock videos in 1977, 79, and it talks about um, how I made. It talks a lot about my work. I think. I think. I was going to ask you what you feel um, gives a piece of art value. That's a tough question. We had this recent situation, for instance, with Jacob Casse. Um, and, and I don't know Jacob at all. I've never met him. So what I'm about to say um, is, is, is completely apart and away from you know any comment on him or any comment on the content of his work. I'm now discussing a market and how dangerous it can be. We're talking about the money question because that's okay. what you brought up. Over time, this perception of an artwork's importance evolved, of course. What might be looked at as extremely important 30 years ago might be totally ignored nowadays. And the market also has a huge influence on that. Often, you know, creativity will follow the market and you see what happens. In most people's mind, you know, prices and importance are the same thing. Mm, which I'm not sure is true. I was standing next to Mara Rubel at uh, the Phillips auction last November. So that would have been November of 2010. The day sale. And a piece by Jacob came up. I believe it's the first piece he ever came up at auction because he's only 20 something. And it was estimated sort of in that range. And we watched it hammer with all in with the VIG for around maybe a little less than $100,000. We sort of looked at each other and we were just, you know, what the fuck was that? So, I, you know, sometimes there's an anomaly at auction. Two people just have to have it, and that's the way it is. Well, I went the following week to the kitchen. Here in New York, Deb Singer, who's the director and a good friend, uh, put together a wonderful benefit auction. And many uh, artists had donated work, and one of them was Casse, which I thought was terribly generous of him. Um, of course, this donation had taken place before the Phillips nonsense. So um, one week after that Phillips sale, benefit auction at the kitchen, and the same sort of painting, same size, sells for, I want to say, around 90000 again, plus minus. So now you know there are some people who have a real hard-on for this work for one reason or another. And it's, it's just odd when they could probably go to the dealer, uh, Augusto, and at 11 Rivington and say, look, I, I have interest in the work and, you know, I'm patient and can you put me on the list and I'd really like to purchase a piece. Um, and I would think if the approach was made in a thoughtful, kind way, you know, without being threatening or whatever, Augusto, who seems to be like a very good guy, would be amenable and it might take some time, a little patience and tenacity is required in these situations, but in most cases is, you know, paid out with a lovely piece at the right price. Well, I don't know if two, these people had an argument with Augusto or just simply didn't want to wait. I have no idea what took place, but what motivated this sudden surge was bizarre. Now, in most cases, Kate's, I suppose from an artist's perspective, they would look at that situation and say, isn't that swell? Um, but it's really not swell. It puts the entire market situation for that artist out of whack because what happens immediately? The people who have bought the work, say, in the past for eight or ten or twelve thousand dollars, suddenly look at what's on their wall and they don't see art anymore. They see money. They see a bag holding a hundred thousand dollars hanging on their wall. For younger artists, like if their if their work gets into an auction house and the price goes up and there's a smaller collector base, it's it, be, it can become problematic. It can, yeah. If, the, if, if an artist gets exposed too young or with not enough maturity to the market, it might affect him personally or his career. I went to the Terrence Co. yesterday at Mary Boone. That was, was he there? Yeah, he was there walking on his knees around the base of the pillar, or not pillar, but the 
pyramid of salt, cone of salt. But it was pretty amazing. He's very anti-market right now. Right. Almost like he's making a work of art that isn't intended to be sold. He's sort of using Mary Boone's gallery, it seems like, to sort of speak out against marketable art. For young artists, the most important thing that they can and should do, and I've felt this way always, is that they need to be in their studio just making the best damn work that they can make, and I just want to be astonished. I don't ask for much, you know. That's all I want. I want to go into their studio and have that, oh my God, moment. Um, and then everything else will follow, trust me on this. I don't. I don't know names. I. It's because I'm jealous because everyone else is showing at like awesome galleries and Daddy's not. So uh, I just would rather sit in my studio and just paint whatever I want to paint and not worry about what's hip or what's not hip. Yo. Well, I have. Vitruvian man, I made it the woman, and then you have yeah, Madonna Lita, I know what great that is. which is nuts. And then since then, I kind of became a little upset. New York with 112, and there were a lot of other things happening at, in New York at that time. There was figurative painting, and there was color field, and things happening and showing at Emmerich or whatever. But this was a group of people who weren't in the commercial world who were very tight and kind of ex not really tuned in. To, they were just tuned into each other. At the point of uh, the mid-50s, post-World War II, New York City, you had all the uh, abstract expressionists were being represented by uptown galleries and they were blue chip. They were making a lot of money and they were very successful. And those galleries were completely uninterested in what anybody new or emerging artists or young artists were doing. I really do think the less you know sometimes the better mm -hmm. and that you focus with a certain group of people and you really get into that. Because if you have all this information, you go, oh, maybe I should be doing that. That's really hip this month. And a lot of that's what happens out of art school, even then. What I've always done at my work is, you know, has to resonate emotionally you know I'm not uh, I'm not uh, I'm not an artist who relies on the history of art and works off the you know the the track of modernism even though the the style of that day was abstract expressionist uh, there was no call at all for the younger artists to do it because nobody wanted what they had to do. So they grew up completely and started developing as artists locked out of the marketplace so they could do anything. I ended up at this dinner in Jean-Michel and I uh, the last, I showed up a bit late and the last seat left was right next to Jean-Michel, so I sat there and he right away started talking to me and we had never really spoken before and so he right away said to me, um, uh, I've been a fan of your work for many years. There was no communication, there's no cell phone, it's just word of mouth and by chance meeting someone who says this.
1985. An exhibition in 1985 in downtown New York. What was it like to get an art review in that era? Because in our era, even if you get an art review, there's a lot of online criticism that happens surrounding the printed word. Michael Howe's band takes us on a walk through that time. What was it like to be involved with the collaborative exhibition of Jean-Michel Basquiat and Andy Warhol? The next day there was a review on the cover of the New York Times Arts and Leisure section, Sunday Times, reviewing the show. The show was on a Thursday or Friday night, I don't remember, but you know, the usual thing. And then the review came out a couple of days later and I met Jean down at Odeon for brunch and he was in a horrible mood and he had just read the review and the review was there at the tent on the table. I looked at it, I read, you know, as much as I could, as quickly as I could and realized like, oh man, this just got completely kind of slammed. And, and also a little bit like Hilton Kramer said in the, in the review that Jean got kind of used, that Warhol used him and that he was like War another one of Warhol's like puppets, you know, that basically he had just totally f fallen for Warhol's trick and that Warhol, you know, kind of just stepped on him, you know, to, to elevate his career, you know, or whatever. It was horrible. It was a really unfair criticism and it had nothing really to do with the work. And, uh, and then again, you know, in this recent movie, Hilton Kramer still stands by his position about Jean-Michel. You know, I don't, I don't remember it verbatim, but it was, it, the, it, it, it's pretty much that he, he says, well, what I said, you know, back then. Was that in The Radiant was, Child or something yeah. like that? It was definitely a rift in the sense that Jean-Michel didn't, like, want to talk to Andy anymore and, and was really upset about the whole thing. And then, and just kind of backed away without having, without any conversation. You know, just didn't talk about, didn't want to talk to him, didn't want to discuss it. And so it was just kind of a, you know, a tough situation. And Andy felt very bad about it and wished he could communicate with Jean-Michel. And he was very concerned for Jean-Michel because Jean-Michel was really, really upset about it. And kind of taking it very personally too. So it was like um, a little bit... Uh, harder on him than, you know, it's like, I mean, I think he really blamed himself for a lot of what, what happened there, whether he realized that or not. And years later, people were like, oh, the photo of Andy knocking Jean-Michel out, you know, this knockout punch photo is so you know, sums up the whole thing. And it's like, you know, not really, but all right, you know, if that's what, you know, if you want to find some irony in it or some mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, kind of deep meaning, deeper, you know, mm -hmm. meaning, okay, the, yeah, you could probably read mm -hmm. into every, you know, every picture if that's the case, but they did all these things for a whole different purpose. Uh -huh. And Jean-Michel set that picture up, so I don't think, you know, if you want to look into the irony of it, did you, so then Jean-Michel set up his own, you know, sort of like, wow. you know, thing, right?
I'm not from New York, I'm from Boston, oh, but okay. I've been here since the 70s. So talking about art, I mean things that were, I mean things are. Do you do, any, do, you do anything that has singing? Do sing? I started doing a sing a singing thing. It's what a is, bitch track. It, you want to play it? Can you sing it? No, it's it's got the whole thing. It's called it's a bitch track. It's called um, How to Be a Top. Oh, it won't sound very good through the the audio on the camera, but if we yeah, but we can play it loud. Hey, Tyler. Oh yeah, give it a try. Tyler. Yeah. Play How to Be a Top really loud. Because I, I for me to reproduce it. This is a track that um, I made. I produced for Jerry. I think I won't do it as well. Just make it super loud because otherwise he can't hear it. Do you do a performance to it? No. I'm going to. I'm going to have two drag queens doing push-ups. But I'm going to do this. I just we just did this last week. This song, I, singing is a new thing for me actually. It's part, but it's part of the persona. I mean, it. My art is basically about me, and my perception of myself, and and in in my world. So, basically, you know, the, that's part of the whole thing is doing this bitch track, which is basically was my idea because there's in gay world there's this top and bottom thing, which in some ways I think is total baloney bullshit because I feel like. It's, it's something that's very changeable, but like some guys say, oh, I'm a top. So I did this song, How to Be a Top. Can you play it? I, well, give me a minute. Um, yeah, so, but it's, it's sort of like because it's reflecting of what's going on in the world today, in the gay world, and I figured people would get a kick out of it, you know. So I did another, what was the other song I did? Uh, listen, have some fun. Oh, yeah, I did another bitch track, which is about, okay, here it is. Tyler did the production. Uh. There's like so many tracks it gets overloaded sometimes. <laughs> On our mood. We're all tops, just depends on what you wanna do. We're all tops, depending on your mood. We're all tops, just depends on what you wanna do. I gotta be a top. Gotta be strong. Do your push-ups and your sit-ups, baby, all day long. <laughs> The reason why I love living in New York is I could uh, go to an area and not just visit one space, but uh, visit maybe, you know, seven spaces in a day. And so you go really go into se seven people's lives. And uh, I, I, I think I'd miss that if I moved to London or to California, where you have to really you know, spend an entire day <laughs> trying to get from uh, maybe one gallery to the next, and maybe you'll see it, maybe three galleries in a day. And erasing that. You know, there's no boundary to being in the art world. You know, you just kind of show up at the party, and you all you, you just have to be there. And you, but you're you you aren't there if if you're not. You know, in London, or you're in not in um, Berlin or, or New York, and I guess we have an interest being New York artists in being kind of provincial and saying it's, it's impossible to be anywhere else. And it's like, I'm sure it really isn't the case, but 
you know, I, I find that the people who have helped me out as mo mostly as an artist have been other artists who are my peers and friends. There's a, there's a kind of collegial community in New York and people look out for each other and help each other out. Um, because we know what goes around comes around and if you're, if you're in a vacuum, you just don't have that advantage. Do you think New York's gonna hold in, hang in there in 20 years, 30 years? I mean, guy, compared to other cities, I mean, Chicago's art scene, I live there. It sucks. I don't want to show with any of those galleries. Most people out there in, in wherever they are in the different parts of the country or different parts of the world, they don't have that connection to like the all of the artists and everything else. Like you have such a deep connection to people all over the world, like really in in every you have a finger in every pot. Are we thinking about communicating with other artists globally? Like when I first came to New York, no, you'd meet someone from a foreign country in like a club or something, and then maybe you'd get over to Europe and find out things that way. But the period between my other friends finding out what I was doing in Europe might take six months. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, we can get it in like six minutes. There was just this incredible social and creative network of people all overlapping and interlapping and interconnected and, and winding together. Presently, right now, on the internet, uh, I am a member of uh, the first uh, All Avatar performance art group. And it's made up of international performance artists from all over the world. What's that called? It's called Second Front. Hmm. And we perform out of Second Life. But we also perform in real life venues, in meat space venues. Like we'll be at an art fair or at a museum or a school or a gallery. And uh, and somebody will be there, like I'll be there with somebody and we'll be projecting a performance but at the same time we're performing as our avatars with our friends who are in Italy or Holland or London, uh, uh, Vancouver, um, uh, Portland, um, St. John's, Newfoundland, um, Toronto and we're, and myself here and we do, we make performances in these real spaces, but also uh, in virtual, in virtual space.